Chapter 18 of The Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Budapest, where East and West meet. O oh, East is East, and West is West, and never the twain shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. Rudyard Kipling is wrong. The East and the West have met here at the capital of Hungary. Budapest is the beginning of the East that looks toward Constantinople, and the end of the West that faces toward Paris. Hungary is a great succotash of the nations. The Hungarian people migrated from the little nest in the Ural Mountains, where more than a thousand years ago some seven tribes joined together under a Magyar prince called Arpad. They made their way across the steppes of Russia, gathering up a scattering of Finns who had drifted down from the forests of the north and captured the rich Hungarian plain in the basin of the Danube. Other peoples had proceeded from there. From the west had come the Romans, eager for this breadbasket of Europe, which has always been coveted by the nations. Before Christ was born, they had fought their way into the valley of the Danube and built settlements here. From the east had come also Avars and Huns, but they failed to weld the valley lands into a state. Equally unsuccessful were the Goths, the Lombards, and the Franks from the west. Finally, the Magyars came in from Asia and took the land. Before the year 1000, the Hungarians had established a line of rulers descended from Arpad and had introduced Christianity. In the first year of the 11th century, St. Stephen, patron saint of the country, received from Pope Sylvester II the golden crown, used at the coronations of all later kings of Hungary. Stephen I brought in German settlers from the west with a view to giving his people a greater measure of civilization. In the early part of the 15th century, the Turks began to make inroads on the kingdom, which they overthrew at the Battle of Mohawks in 1526. After that, the country was under Turkish domination for 150 years. Following the defeat of the Moslems at Vienna in 1683, however, Hungary was freed from the yoke of the Sultan, but in return for the help of the Austrians, the Magyar crown was made hereditary in the Habsburg line. Thus, east and west swayed back and forth over the fertile plains of Hungary. Both Orient and Occident have left their marks, as one can easily see in Budapest today. Here, the Gothic, the Romanesque, and the Oriental styles of architecture appear side by side. The royal palace, the great castle on the heights of Buda, high over the Danube, has a half dozen great domes rising above a wilderness of Greek and Roman columns, while its interior blazes with eastern magnificence. It is one of the mightiest palaces ever constructed. It is more than a thousand feet long, and its rooms number 860. It was built by the Empress Maria Theresa three quarters of a century ago. Today, the Hungarian people keep it as a residence for a monarch of the future, and when another king comes to the Hungarian throne, he will probably live there. Not far from it is the Coronation Church, begun in the 13th century in the Romanesque style, and completed in the 15th in the Gothic. It was used as a mosque by the Turks, and the marble statue of the Virgin looks down on the floor, which the Mohammedans touched with their heads in their prayers. Even the present Parliament building, where the one house of the Hungarian Congress is now sitting, is a combination of the East and the West. It has a great Oriental-looking dome in the center, and more than a dozen Gothic spires rising from its walls. I wish I could take you through this national capital. It covers as much ground as the Congressional Library at Washington, and it cost more. Its construction stretched over almost 20 years, or just about as long as it took to erect the Great Pyramid of Egypt. On the outside, there are 90 statues, and within you bump into the image of some national hero at almost every step. The windows are of stained glass, the floors are of parquetry or marble, and the walls are colored marbles inlaid with gold. A porter accompanied me through the building and, figuratively speaking, gave me the keys. 
I visited the gorgeous House of Lords. Its seats are empty today, but as I looked at them, my guide said, they will be filled as soon as we again have a king. And when will that be, I ask? It may be in 10 years, and it may be in 20, but it is sure to come sooner or later. Hungary has had kings for 1,000 years. We like them, and we want a king back on our throne once more. My way into the top gallery of the house was up winding stone steps like those of a cathedral, lighted by windows with as many colors as the coat Jacob had made for Joseph before the boy was sold down into Egypt. When I came out, it was into a great dome-shaped room that reminded me somewhat of a mosque of Turkey or India. Here again, the East and the West seemed to meet. The lower house of Congress sits in a hall that is a combination of the interiors of a cathedral, a mosque, and a palace. The galleries are divided into boxes like those of a theater, and each box has its pillars carved and encrusted with gold. There is a slice cut out of one side of the chamber, and against the flat wall set the speaker. Below, the members were seated at desks in concentric rows. In a little arena in front of the clerks were the ministers of state, seated in red velvet chairs. With one exception, all the members were dressed in business suits. The exception wore silk, and I venture had on high-heeled shoes. She was black-haired and black-eyed, and the only woman member of the Hungarian Congress. She is a socialist. The people of Budapest show everywhere evidence of the blending of the East and the West. Although since the Treaty of Trianon carved up Hungary, one sees fewer of the Germans and the Czechs and a greater number of the pure Magyar type than in the past. The faces show the mixture of races, but the life and the fighting spirit of the Magyar are everywhere predominant. The women are especially beautiful, more beautiful, I think, than any I have seen elsewhere. They have olive complexions, dark, luxuriant hair, and great dark eyes. They walk with a swing, and they have fine figures. Every afternoon, the Francis Joseph promenade along the Danube is alive with a throng of the well-to-do men and women strolling back and forth. They go singly and arm in arm, lovers, sweethearts, husbands, and wives moving on side by side. There are officers in gorgeous uniforms and representatives of half a dozen different nationalities and as many different creeds, the Greek Catholic and the Roman Catholic, the Protestant and the Jew, all mixed up together. This is the social hour of the city, and much of it is spent in drinking tea, coffee, or liqueurs at the many cafes that line the route. Even more than in Vienna or Paris is it the fashion in Budapest to frequent outdoor restaurants. Except in cold weather, there are tables on the street and thousands sit about them talking or listening to the music of the gypsy bands, which, it seems to me, are playing from sunset to far into the wee hours of the morning. I had thought of this part of the world as having a civilization a little lower than that of the other European capitals. If so, no lack appears in the dress, the talk, or the manners of the people. The women know how to buy their clothes and how to wear them. Their frocks look as if they had just come from the shops of Paris. The men are especially particular about their dress, and the dandies have a fashion of harmonizing the colors from stockings to collars. On official occasions, the men are meticulous about their costumes. The uncomfortable silk hat still holds sway, and at daytime events, the morning cutaway suit is much in evidence. The men make me think of that stiff member of the Crawley family in Vanity Fair, of whom Thackeray says he would rather die than sit down to dinner without a white necktie. Everyone here dines late. At seven o'clock, there is no one in the dining rooms of the hotels, and the restaurants do not begin to fill up until nine. From then until after midnight, the eating goes on, many people taking nothing until after they leave the theater or opera. The gypsy band at the Duna Polata Hotel, where I am staying, plays from nine until two o'clock in the morning. The food at the hotels is good. Pastries and sweets are shipped from Budapest all over Europe. The beef, the mutton, and the pork are equal to those of Chicago. Some of the dishes are similar to ours. 
there is for instance kerkeres which means corn on the cob and one bites it off just as he does in america another favorite dish is paprika buben or chicken dressed with red pepper and another is gulvas or goulash which is a steamed dish highly peppered gefultus paprika consists of pepper pods filled with meat and there is a delicious chowder called balazel the restaurants serve a kind of macaroni with chicken called tarbanva which takes up a permanent residence in one's stomach the coffee is good and is served black in french or turkish style as ordered it is difficult for the foreigner to know what to eat from the bill of fare for it is printed in magyar which someone has said is a hungarian goulash of the words the tartars and the finns could not spell or pronounce and so threw out of their languages the combination of letters appear meaningless to me the words are full of consonants and the marks over the vowels add to the confusion the accent always falls on the first syllable in names of persons the family name is put first for instance i attended an independence day celebration here when the crowd hurrahed for george washington the speaker who started the cheers shouted heap heap ooray with the accent on the oo and the cry was for washington george the observance of our fourth of july took place in front of the great bronze statue of washington that the hungarians of america have erected in the central park of budapest to show their appreciation of their adopted country everyone here seems to like the united states and no greater tribute could be given our nation than the thousands of all classes who stood with bared heads for more than an hour in the broiling midsummer sun while the speeches were made budapest has grown considerably in the last few years at the time of the world war it had less than eight hundred thousand people it has now more than a million and the population is increasing right along like all of the capitals of this part of the world it has had large accessions on account of the changes in boundaries the hungarians claim that they are persecuted in Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, and those who wish to retain their citizenship in the mother country are flocking back home. Many who owned property in what was once a part of the kingdom have been compelled to sell at low prices, and as a result, there are upwards of a 100,000 refugees in Budapest. This is one of the chief reasons for the increase of more than 300,000 in population within two or three years. There is naturally a great lack of housing facilities, and the prices of apartments and rooms are steadily rising. Budapest has a large intellectual class. Hungary has four universities, including one here at Budapest, which has above 10,000 students. The city has a school of economics with 2,500 students and a technical high school with more than 3,000. Count Paul Telecki the well-known professor of economic geography, tells me that he has 800 men in attendance upon his lectures and that one of them is a general of 63 who takes his notes side by side with beardless boys of 19 and 20. Most of the students are comparatively poor. Many of them have lost their all in the countries cut off from Hungary and a large proportion are working their way through the universities by clerking or other labor during the day some have places in the banks which close here at one o'clock and others are employed in the jewelry stores which close at four the rest of the shops are open until six when steel shutters come down over the windows hiding everything until late the next morning among other ways of reducing expenses the students have established cooperative societies they have clothing factories where they work part of the day to make clothes to sell to each other at cost price or a little more and shoe factories where they make their own shoes they have established a printing house with a half dozen presses where they print some of their textbooks and lecture notes end of chapter 18